so clear in this book, The English in Love. You're saying that love played a special role in the 20th century. You talk here about an emotional revolution. And I found in here that you say something even stronger that I found very intriguing. You say that, I'm now citing you, an emotional revolution not only predated any sexual revolution, it provided the necessary conditions for such change. How does that work out for you, the sort of emotional revolution and the sexual revolution and them being linked in with each other in the middle of the 20th century? I think emotion is a stronger driver of change than sex is. Um, I think in the middle of the 20th century, something quite distinctive happens to, to emotion and to its sort of power within British society. Um, emotion is, is really drawn upon and exploited by the state during the Second World War. Um, the idea of a collective emotion as underpinning the war effort, um, the way in which emotion is, is exploited both within the home and also um, within um, the public sphere. Individuals are encouraged to think about their homes, to fight mm -hmm. for their homes. Um, but the home is also seen to be the, um, the sort of bulwark of the nation as well. Um, so you already have this way in which private emotion is also public emotion coming out of the Second World War. And I think in the 40s mm -hmm. and into the 50s, um, this becomes mapped onto all sorts of other um, reconstruction politics which have emotion at their heart. So the focus on children in post-war Britain is very much about their emotional well-being. The role of psychoanalysis in supporting this is clear. Um, but emotion is implicated in all sorts of other public debates, whether it's debates about um, capital punishment and whether this is a good or bad thing, or whether it's um, public discussion about the monarchy, for example, whether Princess Margaret um, should marry a divorcee in 1955 or not. So there's a lot of emotion going on in post-war Britain. It's very much part of the public sphere. Um, and I think individual um, emotional relationships, and in this context, love relationships acquire um, a significance and a power um, that perhaps they haven't had previously uh, within public life. So it becomes something that people can increasingly make claims about that the, um, the idea of being in love with somebody um, becomes increasingly a rationale for all sorts of behaviour. Um, you know, in the courts you see people defending bigamy on the basis of, of having authentically fallen in love. Uh, you certainly have people defending adultery on the basis of falling in true love. Um, and of course, when the marriage laws um, are reformed in 1969, you do see an increase, a significant increase, in divorce uh, for people not necessarily wanting to just get out of marriages, but wanting to get out of one marriage because they want to marry somebody else with whom they are more properly in love. Um, so I think love has a power, emotion more broadly has a power, and that's not to say that sex isn't important as well, but I just think that perhaps emotion is more important. But you said about love justifying all sorts of things. I mean, one thing that you consider very important in here is this, is the, you call it a trope, the, the trope of love at first sight. And I find this really quite, quite fascinating. Um, you then say that um, this, this love at first sight trope denotes the triumph of feeling over rational assessment and suggests the intervention of fate in the shape of a serendipitous meeting in assuring long-term happiness. Is that the individual justifying it to themselves or to their parents or to wider society? And I thought mm. perhaps all of those. I think it both, it, it gives people a sense of agency because ultimately you can, there's a pragmatism involved in love. You can decide that this is love at first sight. Mm. Um, but it also gives a, a sort of a, a, a veneer of, of, of a fatalism to it as well. It's inevitable, it's unstoppable, you can't help it. Um, and that uh, a sort of movement between sort of um, agency and passivity in the experience of love, I, I'm quite interested in, um, and the ways in which people are able to move between those two, sometimes quite self-consciously. Um, I think love at first sight it clearly is not an invention. 
of the um, post Second World War period, and it's certainly not um, an English invention. Um, but I think what I was interested in was the way in which love at first sight was so widely implicated in people's personal love stories, the narratives that they constructed of their lives, um, sometimes in positive ways and sometimes in negative ways. Lots of people write about um, meeting their husband or their wife, being love at first sight, and this set them up for years and years of happiness. Um, but there's also a more critical edge to it. Um, some people say, yes, they bought into um, love at first sight, but actually it proved to be disastrous because falling in love at first sight is stupid. You know? mm -hmm. um, and actually more practical, uh, what some might describe as rational um, considerations should have been taken into account. Um, but it's really there, it's there a lot in um, the popular media of the time, women's and girls' magazines in particular, the idea that you might fall in love at first sight and also you will probably be able to find your one true love. The idea that there is somebody out there for you, um, you just have to look hard enough to find them. That is also something that we actually find in philosophy and in Plato, in this um, myth of Aristophanes in Plato's Symposium, the, the idea that at some point we were ball-shaped creatures and yeah. then because we were too powerful the gods split us into halves and now we are running around looking for our other half. It's very fascinating, I think, sort of what, what it would mean if there indeed was only one person out there for each of us. Yeah. Well, there's actually a debate in one of the teen magazines, uh, I think it's in Boyfriend magazine, um, mm -hmm. which is a very popular magazine of, of the period, um, where they get two teenage girls to debate this question on their pages. One girl is like, yes, there is one true love for everybody. And the other girl points out, well, actually, this is a bit mad. Because if this, and it's precisely your point. So are we going to travel the world looking for him? Um, so it's, and it's done in a kind of um, a slightly kind of tongue-in-cheek, um, sort of funny way. But it gets to the heart of that issue, that, that central issue, which is about there being a sort of soulmate. Um, mm. And you only have to really, you know, if you find that soulmate, then everything will be all right. Which, of course, is also tied to the wider structures within which love is operating in this period. Um, structures which prescribe heterosexuality. Um, and which prescribe marriage. This is a period where marriage is more popular than it has been ever before um, in Britain. Um, and it's very difficult to get out of marriage once you're in it. So of course you want to meet a soulmate. Um, you want it to be one true love because actually, you know, with rising um, you know, age at death as well, you might be living with this person for a really long time. So you have to make sure that it's the right one. So you also then get a lot of anxiety about the authenticity of love um, and whether you have actually met Mr. Right or Ms. Right um, or whether you know, you're just falling in love with them because you like the look of them or whether sex is getting in the way. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of the 20th century, there's a lot of debate about how you actually diagnose love. There were many really interesting moments about that in here, I thought. I mean, in in relation to this love at first sight topic, there was also something very interesting about dislike at first sight. And then there is this, I really like this one entry from, I think it's one of the mass observers, um, a man in any case, who, um, who reports that initially he didn't really like the sight of his, um, of, <laughs> of his wife to be at all. And then he writes, I asked myself, would I like to sleep with her often? And that can be a sort of alternative. In other words, um, it, it, there can also be a kind of thought experiment, like do I, even though I perhaps don't like the, just the looks of this person so much, or even though I initially wasn't really attracted, now some kind of thought experiments as to how people can sort of make a life together and whether they can imagine that to be quite nice. Um, it, if, I can, if I can just um, maybe refer to, to one other moment there that I um, found quite interesting. Again, also somebody who is sort of, um, who is in, in certain ways quite pragmatic. And to me, this had quite a sort of contemporary relevant ring to it also. Um, there is somebody 
This is now definitely a mass observer, a 36-year-old married Royal Air Force clerk. And he writes, I should say that the first essential is similarity of outlook. I think that husband and wife must hold the same fundamental views. Their ideas must agree on the having and upbringing of children. And so on and so forth. And we, we all know that statistically having children is one of, uh, I mean, correlates very highly with divorce. So having children <laughs> makes it very likely to become divorced later on. But it's not so clear why that is the case. Um, I mean, it puts constraints on the relationship and so on. But I think this is actually this is actually really an important point, the sort of similarity of outlook, because mm. especially when it comes to upbringing children nowadays, there are so many different ideas out there as to how it really should be done and shouldn't be done. So it's interesting to me that that is already a topic in, in the middle of the 20th century. I think it absolutely is. And, and obviously, as um ideas about more mutual practices of child rearing, not necessarily actual mutual practices of mm -hmm. child rearing, but the idea that, that, that fathers as well as mothers should, should, mm -hmm. should play a role. Um, I think those tensions become more acute. Um, I think that there are other issues that play there as well, though. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's this sort of exclusivity model of love that develops in the second part of the 20th century where kind of love and sex become so central to identity and the idea that you should become sort of almost your, your central self-fulfillment is through um, an intimate relationship with another adult um, has implications for how parents relate to their children. Um, and that sort of squeezing, even though there's so much about children and children's emotional well-being in the, the, the middle of the 20th century, the exclusivity of the parental, the, the adult relationship, mm. can be at odds with that. Um, so you get mothers are expected to invest emotionally, heavily emotionally in their husbands, and invest heavily in their children. Mm. Um, husbands and fathers are, sometimes find that a little bit more problematic, <laughs> um, and experience the emotion that is being invested by their wife into their children um, as a denial of some of the emotion that they should be getting. So there's a whole sort of weird emotional economy going on um, where ultimately I think women are just doing a whole load of emotional work um, and having a lot asked of them, but not necessarily a lot given to them.